All right, this is my genre analysis video essay for intro to film, TV, and animation. Uh, my name is Cooper Flora, and this is going to be the video version of what would be my final essay for this class, an analysis on a specific genre. And we're going to be looking at three movies and their plot conventions and how they all tie together. Um, so I have the rubric pulled up, and I also have uh, my detailed outline pulled up from before. I'd also like to point out that in the video portion description for this uh, project, uh, the tech the tech part isn't as concerned. What you're most concerned with uh, from what I'm gathering is content. So I'm going to do my best to get the content out. Um, that's the number one priority. It doesn't ex The rubric doesn't exactly say whether or not this can be formal or informal. So I'm going to try my best to stay formal. But like, obviously, I have a couple jokes ready to go um, if that is deemed not worthy of a good grade then i guess i will take those points um i will tank those points so here we go this is my genre analysis video essay and yeah the genre that i chose is going to be science fiction um this is just one of my favorite genres and the thesis that i'm going to be util utilizing for this essay is that over time science fiction films science fiction films have presented an increasingly dystopian vision of alternate worlds alternate futures um, and the films that I'm going to be choosing for this project or that I have chosen, um, for the one that has to be before 1950, I chose things to come. Um, that was made in 1936. And then I chose star Wars, a new hope for the one that had to be made after 1950. That was released in 1977. And then any movie made after 1990, I believe it was the criteria. Well, I chose interstellar made in 2014. So. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about the plot conventions. We're going to talk about the plot conventions, thematic conventions, and the visual style and the iconography and the sound um, for what would be a science fiction movie. Um, and then later we're going to talk about how those things are changed or increasingly held um, in each, each three of these movies. I don't know what hand to hold this best with. So... First off, we have our plot conventions um, of specifically science fiction. So what I've found typically in science fiction movies is that the main character um, is introduced um, and they are a humble farm boy, f humble farm boy um, and they come from a land not within this science fiction realm that the, most, that the majority of the movie dives into. Um, in this new world that they enter, um, they, are they are faced with tough decisions. And near the end of the film, typically in a science fiction movie, this character is going to be faced with a decision um, either one way or the other, either in the good of mankind or um, the, the future of the world um, or in his own self-image um, and his own selfishness. The thematic conventions that we see, uh, one of the biggest thematic conventions of a science fiction film um, are encounters with futuristic species or um, aliens of some kind. Um, another common thematic convention of a science fiction film is going to be like a, a brighter hope for the future. Or uh, we start off the mo we start off the film in a in kind of like a bad state or like a like a like a like there's no hope. And then over the course of the film, it's characters building hope and quite literally talking about hope. Um, and uh, whether this leads to a darker future or even brighter future, that is the, that's like the ultimate point of most science fiction films, I believe, um, is we started here, we got to get better, which is, a, which is a thematic convention for a ton of movies in general, actually. Um, but so the visual style uh, that I've noticed in some science fiction films is that they often involve some visual shots of either space or uh, futuristic, dystopian, very clean slate um, things that introduce a positive future um, and then very like dark and gritty um, giant groups of people huddled up, um, cornfields in some instances, like dust clouds, like things like that, that kind of signify or like big poor areas like, um, like city streets, like raining, like things like that kind of differentiate the two between dystopian and, and uh, futuristic. Just, I don't know what the diff Bad future, good future. Um, and another one that I want to point out too is that in a lot of science fiction films, and I didn't actually notice this until after I rewatched these movies, um, it's 
quite often that in these movies there's going to be something very very big like in the foreground or the background and then there's very something small so like an interstellar um in this picture here of the spaceship right in front of the unbelievably massive black hole um that's an example um and then like in star wars the death star giant thing and then like the little tiny millennium falcon approaching it so in a lot of science fiction films there's a lot of there's a lot of comparison between massive and small um, the iconography and sound that is seen in a ton of science fiction films um, are going to include loud blasts of trumpets or horns especially during like space travel um, the iconic uh, hyper light speed sound uh, from star wars um, and just other space sounds guns um, laser beams um, another typical sound uh, seen in science fiction films is going to be like like rocket engines like big energetic blasts um, and then the typical iconography is going to be tall beaming skyscrapers uh, bright lights and uh, very full images that are meant to give you the sense of overwhelmness um, as compared to like a romantic movie like a rom-com where it's just like Oh, like very comfortable, like, oh, you know, like we're in a kitchen making grilled cheese. Um, but science fiction films, typically every single frame is typically meant to make you uncomfortable, actually. Um, so, yeah. So the first film that we're going to be talking about is Things to Come. Um, the summary, I'm going to, okay, these plot summaries, I'm not going to go in depth because I don't want that to take up the whole uh, thing. Basically, this movie consists of three periods of time. Um, it starts off in 1945, and then it goes to 19... Or no, it starts off in 19... No, it starts off in 1935. It starts off like a couple years before World War II would have happened. And there's this, this, there's like this tension of like, oh, there's going to be a war. Uh, um, and then immediately it happens. Um, the second part of the film is set in like 1966 or 1970. And that is where we see the first glimpse of our main character. Uh, why am I blanking on his name? Harold? No. Gordon? No. I don't remember. And uh, this guy's seemingly from the future, but he's really from this company called like Communications Inc. or something like that. And see, like, I don't know if this is very formal, but whatever. Um, and they they come to the like present part of the film, like the middle part of the film and they're challenging um, every, every land. I think that's what it's called. The town, every land or every town in 1966 or 1970 post the beginnings of the war. And there's this tension of is future good? Like, should we trade with each other? Should we try to get back or should we be more resilient and try to hide from each other? Um, and that scene with, I think his name is the boss. Um, and that's why I have this photo here of him like being like sad because he like he wants to travel and he wants to like get money and stuff, but he doesn't actually want to interact with people. Um, and so this guy from the future, he's not from the future, but I like to say he is because he kind of is. Um, he comes and then they get into an argument, they get into a little battle, and then we skip a hundred years. We're in two thousand and forty-five or thirty-five, and we are now in this period of like complete dystopia um it looks pretty but then you find out that they're going to the moon or that they're trying to like go into the anyway uh and this space gun like they so they try to go to the moon or they they try to go to space and we actually don't even see them in space so there's a chance they never made it um one of the ways that things to come is extremely different from like interstellar and star wars is that the actual physics of a space gun like that are like unbearably ridiculous coming as an engineer coming from an engineer major a giant space gun that shoots the th like it just it's it makes no sense uh which is why movies like interstellar um kind of fit more into that science fiction category or more applicable science fiction category so over time these movies have increasingly become more realistic and more um yeah just more realistic even though they've gotten more like out of pocket so the relation to the those genre conventions um 
for the plot convention, yeah, we have our main character who was introduced, um, and he kind of is coming from like a humble beginning like he's just some dude with the company and then by the end of the movie he's like the top dog and then he's like ah i want to go to space because you guys are bad ah and so they go to space and that's where kind of he leans into more his selfish uh motivations at this point 100 years later he's no longer doing what he's doing for the good of humanity um which is kind of where it all started with the war it's like the war started it's like okay let's end this and then it became this constant uh, drag of when are we ever going to rest? When are we ever going to stop trying to dig ourselves out of the hole? And that's what ultimately leads to a crazy dystopia. Um, thematic convention. I'm never, I, this is going to take 30 minutes. I got to speed up the convention genre, the thematic conventions of this genre, um, encounters with the futuristic ideas, really futuristic planes, uh, space guns, things like that. Um, just absolutely wild uh, visual style. There's a ton of imagery, especially with the with the space with a space gun of giant things and then little people uh, running around, or a bunch of or a bunch of airplanes flying around each other. Just a lot of big visual uh, frames in this film. The iconography and or the sound. A lot of the sound. There was a lot of trumpet blasts. Um, I'm gonna stick to one or the other. The trumpet blasts and the like the explosions, like from the guns and the cannons, um, make you feel unsettled and make you feel like, oh my gosh, okay, this is a war. Like something bad is happening. And the trumpet blasts and like the intense music comes back. It, it happens at the very beginning with, the, with like the war breaking out in the streets. And then it comes back when they're going to the moon, which is crazy. Like it's, it's, it's interesting to see. It's the same thing. Like war... Like war I, th I I wrote war equals, um, war equals evolution. It's the same thing. It's constant chaos and money being spent and people getting hurt. And that's one of the things I talk about in the future is all these people are like getting hurt doing all this stuff. Like this isn't good. Like, yeah, we may go to the moon, but like people are dying. This is bad. Um, cool. So yeah, I'm going to move on. Star Wars, uh, plot summary of Star Wars. So Luke Skywalker is our humble farm boy, um, and then when he gets a message from the um, from Princess Leia and R two D two about how oh we gotta we gotta destroy the Death Star, go get Obi Wan Kenobi, have him mentor you, ah, you're our only hope. Um, it very quickly goes from like a very sad movie about this loser on a farm um, on some random planet, ultimately becoming the face of the rebellion against the Galactic Empire. And you could almost consider Star Wars a sequel to um, Things to Come. You could kind of see the futuristic. You could kind of see like the advance of Things to Come leading into a, an, a galactic republic of Star Wars, um, which is actually very interesting. And um, yeah, the movie's about Luke Skywalker becoming uh, the chosen one, I guess, and ultimately shooting the blasters through the Porthole of the Death Star, which is the ultimate way that the Galactic Republic blows up all the other planets and takes oppression over the galaxy. And uh, the movie ends with the hero's journey being complete of Luke Skywalker choosing the selfless act of going to fight and going to eliminate the Galactic Republic. And uh, yeah, that's the plot summary of Star Wars. And it, you can very well see the plot convention of young young noble boy um becomes main character be has a chance to rise up um and ultimately he makes that decision of selflessness which was the opposite of the last film thematic conventions um aliens futuristic tech um brighter future ahead we have a very poor life going on on tatooine um, we have oppression throughout the entire galaxy and the whole movie the movie's called a new hope um, it wasn't titled that until later, but the movie is about building hope and becoming a better society. How, what can we do to free ourselves from this oppression, which is very similar to things to come. How can we free ourselves from this war? Does it result in the futuristic dystopia? Are those two things different? Um, the visual style, we have a ton of light speed stuff. We have bright neon lights. Um, we have... 
the giant Death Star and then the tiny Millennium Falcon right in front of it. Um, there's a ton of other like moments where there's a giant spaceship in front of a tiny star or like a planet or a spaceship hovering over one person on a planet. Um, and that is a clear connection to the visual style seen in other science fiction films a big giant overwhelming scary looking thing um, futuristic you don't understand it it's mechanical and then it becomes then over time you learn about it let me take a sip of water yeah this is very informal i hope anyway um iconography and sound i'll go sound the light speed sound um, the blasters of the uh, X-wings, the uh, music, the the incredible, the incredibly um, iconic music of Star Wars, and the I guess those are the only two I can think of. But just those like those like weird sounds that like just don't sound like they're from Earth, and they're not. Um, and that's when you're sitting in the theater and you're going, okay, like this is not a movie based on Earth. When you're watching a rom com. You're hearing people sing. You're hearing people. You're hearing people drive cars or like go for a bike ride, and there's like birds chirping. Those are things very familiar. Almost every sound in Star Wars, except for the people talking. Not even all the people talking, because there's aliens in different languages. A lot of the sound in this movie is unfamiliar. Um, it's cool, but it's intimidating because it's like, where? What is this world? Um, yeah. I think I'm done with Star Wars. Oh, I was gonna say one more thing. Tip, okay, so talking about how the space gun is unbelievably unrealistic and like would never work in real life. Um, Star Wars does it a little bit better. 30 years later, 40 years later, um, the next sci-fi movie that's made is a little bit more realistic. Um, obviously, these things are incredibly like profound, like a Death Star and uh, these spaceships and stuff. Um, but they're not impossible, especially in zero gravity space, like having a giant tortilla not tortilla, Dorito-shaped ship and like a giant space ball. Those things are not impossible. The shape of the Millennium Falcon being a disc, like that's valid. Like those things can be made. Um, it's just a matter of like the resources available. Um, but the idea of having an X-Wing that has wings on it flying through space, there's no molecules in space. So you have no airfoil. There's no way your airfoil should be able to produce lift by putting pressure. Anyway, this is not physics. Um, yeah, so we're getting better. We are getting better at understanding physics as time goes on in this genre, which is great. It's great to notice how in a hundred years of movies, we're learning more about how the movie should be made. Should it be more realistic? Should it be less realistic? The more realistic do you get? What does that do to the plot? What does that do to the ideas of the movie? Does it make, does it undermine them? Okay. Moving on to interstellar. Um, plot summary of Interstellar, we got, um, Dr. Cooper, which is funny because we have Cooper doing a video with Dr. Cooper for Dr. Cooper. Um, and, uh, yeah, so he's a farm man. He, they're all farmers. He's a farm guy and he used to work for NASA. And then the movie opens with, um, these weird things happening, meddling with space time. Um, and then eventually NASA comes out to him. He's living a good life. He's being joyful. But you notice how there's dust storms. It's a dystopia. We're running out of food. Um, and Michael Caine comes out and he's like, you need to go to space because we need to find a new solar system. And Matthew McConaughey is like, but I got kids. And so the entire movie is about space. Like, it's, it's a cool space movie. There's a ton of stuff. Like, every image is space. But the one thing that this movie does better than any sci-fi movie that I've talked about or have, you probably might ever see, um, the entire foundation of this film is Cooper's love for his daughter. The reason he's doing all this is completely out of selflessness. He's doing it for his daughter. He loves his daughter. He would not be alive probably without his daughter. Um, even though like we're in this dystopia, like no food, his wife's dead. Um, it's like gross area. This, the whole foundation of the film is based upon his love for his family. Um, and that's something that the other movies could have done better. Star Wars, 
it was about kind of like, oh, I'm doing this for my friends. Um, Han comes in. He's like, oh, I don't like you guys. But then he's like, oh, I kind of like you guys. I'll save you guys. So, And then things to come. Um, there's a little bit of emotion at play, especially in the beginning, about like, oh, I'm scared of war. Um, but that kind of goes away, and they don't really touch back on it. Well, not exactly with those characters. They eventually, they eventually talk back on it with new characters in the future, but it just didn't land with me. Um, anyway, so Cooper goes to space, and he ends up saving the world, um, and he goes through time travel and space stuff, and it's this whole complicated mess, but the main gist is he does it all for his daughter, um, and he ends up... Um, making the sacrifice play, letting himself slip into the black hole, gaining years of, of, of time have pa having passed on earth. But what he did was even though it may have been painful or it may have killed him, it gave him the opportunity to relay the information that they collected from other solar systems and give it back to earth and ultimately help earth become interstellar and get off the planet and find new life elsewhere. I, t I could talk about this movie for 30 minutes. Um, I could talk about any of them. Anyway, so the plot conventions of this movie, um, in the science fiction films, there is the young farm man who has an opportunity to redeem himself and become better, and that's what he does. And Cooper ends up making the sacrifice play. You could actually say it was a little selfish um, because of the fact that no, actually, no. He went to the black hole. He had no idea he was going to be able to see like his daughter in the black hole. Um, yeah, he laid down his life. He made the sacrifice play. He did ultimately what he needed to do in order to preserve mankind in his head. Um, I would argue that in things to come, uh, the main character did the things that he did kind of almost out of uh, selfishness and out of ego. He did not do it. He did not do what he thought was best for um, humanity. Anyway, in Interstellar, he makes a sacrifice play, and then all of humanity gets saved. Really touching moment with him and his daughter. His daughter's in like a hundred. Um, makes me cry every single time I watch it. Thematic conventions of this genre. Genre. Uh, one of the biggest thematic conventions seen in this one um, that I talked about before is that encounter with uh, futuristic life or alien life. Um, they're not aliens, but they have these moments in the movie where they're interacting with the future. And it's almost like they're interacting with, well, they are interacting with their future selves, but it's almost like they're interacting with their own ideas. They're interacting with their own, they're interacting with like the answer you wish you knew in 50 years. They're, 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 they're being taught the lessons that they wish they knew, um, if that makes sense. The visual style seen in this film, um, ton of giant, deathly looking black holes, mountains of water, um, spinning objects that make no sense. And uh, yeah, just a bunch of terrified fire, uh, endless fields of corn that to me represent like humanity and like they're being burned, like they're dying, like we have to fix this thing. Um, I mean, I should have done X-Men Days of Future Past for this, for 20, for the, anyway. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of like neon lights. This movie's a little darker, like visually speaking. Uh, there's some moments like in some planets, like the, like the, the space, like the ice planet is very bright. Other than that, this movie is pretty dark, I would say. Not as like neon as you would like it to be, but that's because it's more realistic. I'll get into that next. Um, this is the most realistic. This might be the most realistic science fiction movie ever made. Um, the So we actually don't know what's inside a black hole. So technically, the fact that there was time travel in that doesn't really violate any laws of physics. Um, the whole idea of how the space took, uh, the spaceship takes off and how it moves around um, is completely valid. Uh, the time that it takes to get place in place, the time dilation, all the math is completely legit. Um, whether or not we have enough fuel that is dense enough to store in those engines, eh, that's debatable. Um, 
would there be a black hole? No, no, no. Would there be a wormhole behind Jupiter? Probably not. And then the way they get around that is saying, oh, the, the futuristic version of ourselves put the black, the, the, the wormhole there. Okay. That's fair. You can say that. Um, as other than, other than like the, other than the theatrical components of the things that we have no idea about in real life physics, this movie's completely valid. Everything about this movie is legit. Um, so you can see the hundred year difference of, we now have a movie that's as impactful as things to come, but it's completely visually, mathematically, and chronologically sound, and it makes sense. Um, I know what that's not. This, I know that's not what this video essay is supposed to be about, but I couldn't help but talk about it. And the sound in this movie, um, oh my goodness, the lack thereof of sound. This one goes actually, yeah. Here we go. So. I would say a quarter of this movie, the sound of it is rocket engines, like deathly terrifying sounds. Um, and there's a couple explosions going on that, that are, that are crazy. And then the music, of course, Hans Zimmer's organs are unbelievably amazing. But what this movie does that almost n no other science fiction film has ever done is the absence of sound typically used once or twice this movie uses it like 80% of the time. Well, I guess I would be 75% compared to what I said before. This movie has moments where there's no sound at all. It's it's terrifying because that's what space is. Space has no sound. So, of course, when you sink into a black hole, the entire theater is silent. It's terrifying. It is terrifying. Um, so, in this way, it kind of moves away from the genre. It pays respect to it, but it explores what it looks like when you when you take realism into account. Um, and when you use that realism to install fear into the mind of the viewer. Okay, so that's all three of those done of the plots. Now I'm looking at the rubric. So I did each film. Um, now I just have to discuss the films in relation to each other. And I have to discuss getting back to the thesis um, and my main argument. So the films in relation to each other. So each one, as I said progresses in realism um and as you can see and as an increase in realism happens a decrease in uh i don't want to say emotion because i feel more emotion for interstellar than i do star wars but you can see a difference where the more real the movie gets the the less vibrant it gets um and the less beautiful i would say interstellar is very beautiful but i i would argue that star wars is more beautiful because of the fact that there's bright neon lights and unrealistically um unrealistic things going on and that's even more present in things to come yeah the space gun looks amazing those giant blimps look amazing um and it's, it's cool for the eye and it's like oh wow this is beautiful um but it's not very realistic so you can see the diff so you can see the graph of the genre um remains the same the more you go up in the, the the more you increase i guess it would look like this the more you increase on your x-axis the more you increase realism the less you have beauty stuff like that um there are tons of parallels between these movies about the main character um sorry i need to silence my phone there are a ton of parallels in this movie about the main character learning the future and growing into the future and then deciding am i going to be good or bad basically um i think i discussed enough actually about the films in relation to each other the entire time i'll do like one more um music is a huge huge key point obviously in like a rom-com there's like moments where like actual songs like pr like with lyrics are helpful but the importance of thematic music that reoccurs throughout a science fiction film helps you compare a bad situation and a good situation and you say okay are these actually different is a war different than giant leaps in evolution um is a spaceship taking off and the chaos involved in that the music that you hear that make that gives me the same emotions as what goes on when you're starting to enter a wormhole and the like the shakiness and the in the in the vibrant that you hear uh from interstellar
So the use of sound is incredibly important in all three of these films. Um, and yeah, I will move on to, oh, <laughs> um, you can't tell me that George Lucas didn't copy uh, Things to Come. I would be shocked, actually, if Things to Come did not inspire Star Wars. As I was watching it, I was like, hmm, some of this is a little sus uh, in a good way, right? That's that's how all films should be. should be referencing one another, taking ideas. Um, the paper ends with a concluding paragraph that summarizes the main arguments and restates the thesis. So the thesis of over time, these film, these science fiction films are increasingly showing a terrible dystopia um, with that vision of an alternate world um, or an alternate future that may be coming. And how do we avoid that? Um, and I think over time, some of these movies have gotten better at actually showing the urgency of the situation things to come it doesn't feel very urgent because it's like oh the war's never going to end um interstellar does it feels more urgent because it's like oh we have 30 days until earth runs out of food um and then i included stuff like back to the future x-men days of future past x-men days of future past has a, a, a real ticking clock there's like minutes before the sentinels are going to come kill the heroes and there, there's some real stakes so i think over time um, all these movies kind of pitch to the science fiction genre in a different way. Um, and they, they have, I think over time, science fiction films have been better at displaying hope and what hope should look like. Um, how hope can save the future interstellar days of future past star Wars. Um, but how hope can also corrupt the future from things to come inception how hope for technology and advancement can actually hurt mankind and can actually really damage us and hurt us uh, as a species and as a humanity Those are the same two words yeah um the paper ends with a concluding paragraph that summarizes the main arguments so yeah my main argument is that over time these films are presenting an increasingly dystopian vision of other worlds and futures and as these movies are coming out they are getting way better at displaying that sense of like urgency and realism i think it's better i think it's better to be more realistic than not obviously you don't want to go lean too much into that because you do want there to be a sense of um emotion at play and so if you make it completely like what we have on earth then it's like well this isn't even a science fiction film anymore but uh being able to explain things makes it less goofy Watching Interstellar and Star Wars feels less goofy than, um, actually that's not true. Star Wars is so goofy, but like watching Interstellar, watching Inception, watching X-Men Days of Future Past, there's things that don't make sense like X-Gene, that's so weird, but you can understand it. Inception, you can understand it going, uh, going into a mind. Okay. In Interstellar, all these like time dilation, it makes sense. You can think about it. Um, so instead of instead of laughing at the movie now like you would maybe in star wars or back to the future instead of laughing at the movie um now you are sympathizing for the characters and you have more time in your head to actually care about what's going on on screen um and the input in the in the in the implications because you're not thinking that giant space gun looks stupid and i know that would never work in real life um yeah i think i hit everything um, I'm sorry this was less informal than I wanted it to be. And uh, yeah, I think I hit everything. I kept everything in Times New Roman font too. Um, and double spaced, even though it's not an essay. Um, I hope this is enough for the video. Um, I am doing this too late. So if you grade it like right before the due date and I don't have enough time to resubmit, I guess I'm taking that burden. Um, so I, I should have I should have done this earlier so I could know for sure whether or not this is a good quality video because I know the essay is supposed to be more formal and more throughout. But I thought that it would be better for me to actually display my emotions about these movies and its implications and how they affect me um, rather than on on paper. I feel like I feel like talking is better than writing, in my opinion. Like I I, I kind of wish that we had to present these. I know there's like 300 people in the class. So we couldn't do that. Um, and I know that like 
I don't know, I've skipped a couple classes, so I know my enthusiasm for the class hasn't been what it should be. Um, but forcing people to like talk in front of a camera, forcing people to give presentations takes people out of their comfort zone and it makes people actually re really appreciate what's going on. I'm obviously not saying how to run your class. Obviously, I think your class has run greatly. The days that I had to skip class or that I wanted to skip class, I had to make it up by watching a movie and I was like, oh, this is so annoying. But no, that's good. That's how you should think about um, going. You shouldn't skip a class. You should not skip a class. You, why are you going to college? Um, and so, yeah, I think the way you run the class is great. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't need to say any of that. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. Um, I think I had another point earlier, but, uh, I think I'm just rambling now. So I think I'm just going to stop the video. Um, I think that concludes, how long is this? Let's see. Oh, oh, how long was this? Oh, 35 minutes. Oh, I am so sorry, Dr. Cooper. I really apologize. I hope there's not a video, uh, there's not a time limit on this. Have a great summer. Uh, thank you for teaching this course. Um, and uh, I'll, hopefully I'll see you in the fall. Have a good one. Thank you.